Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. I appreciate you giving us the opportunity for my wife, Claudia, and I to uh, share the things that we have learned over our 52 years of marriage. It's been, uh, it's been a long road. We didn't always do it right, but we're here, and uh, we're still in love with each other. We've made it. She's still my best friend, but it was a long way getting here. So we want to share that story with you as we go through these different uh, series. You know, God said through the prophet Hosea in chapter 4, he says, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge. And that is no more true than in the area of marriage. Unfortunately, marriage is a topic that is... Uh, probably the least understood, even in the church. And even the instructions that we've been given over the years in church sometimes did more harm than they did good because they were not properly explained. And the old saying is, you know, if we have just enough information to be dangerous, and that's kind of what has happened uh, to us a lot in, in our life. You know, it's too bad that marriage even in the church, has the same divorce rate as marriages that are not Christian. I mean, that's really a shame, isn't it? And it's all because of a, a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding. John Wayne, who was a very famous actor, he said, life is hard, but it's even harder if you're stupid. <laughs> And I have to say that that works in marriage as well. I have to say it worked in my marriage, in our marriage. Life was hard, but it was even harder because I was I didn't know anything about marriage when I was married, when I got married. I had no idea what was expected of me, what I needed to do as a husband. And so I just bumbled through you might say the first 30 years of our marriage because I had no idea what I was doing. Do you know it takes more knowledge to get a driver's license than it does to get a marriage license? That's true, isn't it? At least in a, in a, to drive a car, you have to read a book. You know, there's a, they give you a general knowledge test or, or a, a book that you have to read. You have to understand the rules of the road. Can you imagine giving somebody the keys to a car without giving them any driving instruction at all or not knowing what the rules are? I mean, we had to learn, you know, to get a driver's license, you had to learn what a double line meant. You know, you can't pass over a double line. When you come to a four-way stop, you have to know who gets to go first. You know, when you go through a school zone, you have to know that the school zone is 15 miles an hour. And what, do you come, what happens when you come to a railroad tracks with the lights are flashing? You know, you have to know these understandings, these rules, or else you could kill yourself out there. And you could kill others for being untrained or unlearned in the rules of driving. Well, the same goes in our marriages. If we don't understand the general knowledge of what, it's, what we're supposed to do in a marriage, we have the same destruction as we would if we were in a car and didn't know what the rules were. You know, in my, might say my, my marriage driving, I blew through stop signs all the time. Had no idea I was supposed to stop. I passed over double yellow lines all the time. I mean, I blew through railroad crossings, not knowing that I was supposed to stop, look and listen. So there was a lot of things that I did because I didn't understand what I was supposed to do. Didn't have any training in that area at all. So it's important that we, that we understand how uh, important it is that we get rules for this, understand the things that we should know or else we're, we're, we're gonna be dangerous when it comes to marriage. You know, when we read a book or when we got our driver's license we had to read we had to understand we had to know what the rules were then we had to take a written test 
And if you didn't pass the written test, you had to take the written test over again. And you had to do it until you passed the test. And then when that's all said and done, then they gave you a driving test. And you had to get inside of a car with a guy with a clipboard and he made sure that you knew what you were doing. Unfortunately, we get nothing like that in marriage. And so we continually hurt each other. We destroy our marriages, we destroy families, and because we just don't have a clue what we're doing. And I have to say that unfortunately, Again, the church has let us all down and not really giving us the instructions that we need in order to have a happy marriage. Marriage is the most important relationship we'll ever have in our life, but yet we get little or no instruction, and so it wrecks havoc. So we're, Claudia and I, we're going to show you over the next several sessions the things that we learn that really helped us, that salvaged our marriage. Because we're going to share our stories here in a moment. I'll go first, and then Claudia will share her story. But I want you to see that we're no different than anybody else out here. We weren't born with any knowledge about marriage. We had to learn just like you do. Somebody gave us the keys to marriage with no instruction and said, hey, go work it out. Well, that didn't work very well. So we had to learn, and we caused a lot of pain with each other because of lack of knowledge. Well, let me share with you my story first, and then we'll let Claudia share her story, and then we'll kind of take it from there. On my 20th birthday, my friends got together and threw me a birthday party. And uh, they invited a bunch of people that some of them I didn't even know. Claudia was one of those. She came walking in with uh, a friend of hers. And the moment she walked through the door, I knew there was something different about her. I mean, she was dressed impeccably. I mean, she wore black patent high heels. I mean, that in, in my <laughs> circle of friends, nobody wore high heels, you know, where they were tennis shoes. And she was so perfectly dressed, she knew color coordinated, and as she walked in, she had an air about her that just struck my attention right away. And I thought, wow, this is something. Who's this? <laughs> so she walks in, and throughout the evening, I, I kind of had my eye on her because she was different than the other girls that I had noticed. And so I was kind of checking her out, you know. I'm, I'm talking to my friends, and I'm I look over and I'm, I'm looking at her high heels. I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and I, I go up a little higher and I'm looking at her legs. <laughs> Those are nice legs, pretty nice legs. And then I went up a little higher and I noticed the skirt she was wearing, it just fit her perfectly in the places that needed to fit. And I was very, you know, held my attention. And as I got a little higher, went up above the waist, I was thinking, yeah, I'd like that too. That's nice. <laughs> but I, I got so caught up in my, my little world I was in right at the moment. As I got to her eyes, I noticed her looking at me. And I thought, oh. I, I turned around real quickly because I thought, man, she caught me red-handed checking her out. Oh. So embarrassed me. So I, I turned around and I thought, oh. What am I going to do? <laughs> but as the evening wore on, I noticed that she was kind of looking at me too. And I thought, well, this is interesting. I don't know what she sees in me, but she's looking at me too. And so as the evening went on a little bit longer, um, there was a slow dance that came on. And Claudia came over from the other side of the room, and she came up to me, and she says, would you like to dance with me? And I said, yeah, yeah, OK. <laughs> So I'm, we're dancing, and after the dance was over, she backs up a little bit, and she looks right at me, and she says, happy birthday. And she leaned, leaned, leaned in, and she kissed me right on the lips, and, and it was like a lightning bolt had struck me. <laughs> I mean, I just, it, it, I just felt it all the way through. It was like sparks had flown. And so from that point on, I, had, I was so smitten with her because there was a chemistry there that just was instant from the start. And so we talked a little bit after that, and then 
The next day, I decided, well, I got the nerve up. I'm going to call her and ask her if she'd like to go out with me. So I did, and she, she said, yeah, she'd go out. So I went to her house, picked her up, and uh, she came to the door dressed again like, wow. And I could smell her perfume, and it was like, this, this woman is amazing. I put her in the car, and we drove to the restaurant, and I'm talking to her. And I get out of the car, and I'm talking, and I notice she's not answering. So I turn around, and she's still sitting in the car <laughs> looking at me. So I thought, okay, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I thought, okay, I gotta go back and get her car door. So I, I opened her car door and she says, thank you for being a gentleman and opening the car for me. Well, right then and there, I knew there was, this was gonna be a whole different deal with her. She set the standard right from day one and I have to say 52 years later, I'm still opening her gar, her, the, the door for her. So we, uh, we went out a lot, we enjoyed talking. I mean, she, this, this woman who, see, I was Joe Sixpack, you have to understand. I was, I'm a high, I was a high school dropout, I was driving a truck. I, I really was unschooled in anything of any kind of class at all. And when I met her, she was, she was into all kinds of the arts and, and civic things that were going, she knew what was on the news. I mean, she could talk about, <laughs> the war in Vietnam and what was happening and why we shouldn't be there. She was talking about the, the, uh, uh, the black uh, civil rights things that was going on. I had no idea any of this was going on, but she was the one that would talk to me about it. And we'd spend hours, her talking and me listening and trying to act intelligent when she would ask me a question and I would respond a little bit because I, I wanted to impress her. But, and so she was, she, uh, her and I, we would spend days, you know, consecutive days going out and, and going to uh, art galleries and going to dinner and, and she even took me to foreign films. It's like foreign <laughs> films. I never heard of a foreign film before. That's where there's no English speaking, it's all subtitles. And these are all intellectual type movies. They're not you know, Mary met Sally things. I mean, these were like deep. And so afterwards, she liked to go to the coffee shop and talk about these, these deep movies. And she would say, didn't you just like the symbolism in that movie, how he did that? And, and I had to do a lot of tap dancing. I had no idea what she was talking about. But I, was, I would ask her, well, yeah, that was very interesting. What was your opinion? And so she would tell me what she thought, and then I just kind of voiced off of her. And so, she didn't know how, uh, that I didn't have a clue what she was talking about, but she was, uh, she was accepting it. And I thought, man, she's buying into this. I, I, you know, I'm good to go for another date. So anyway, we, we, we dated for about a year that way. And I, was, I just couldn't help not being with her. I wanted to be with her all the time. She just was just a, an amazing person. Somebody that I'd, I I'd never dreamed that she would be even attracted to me. I mean, what did I have to offer? I had nothing. Well, I had a sports car with chrome wheels on it, but that, that was it. I mean, I didn't really have anything else, but she was attracted, and so she wanted to be with me, and I just thought this was the greatest thing because she was way out of my league as far as I was concerned, but she was, she, she was attracted to me, and I was to her, and so we continued to date, and we did this for about a year, and then I, one day I just got the nerve up to ask her if she would marry me. And when she said, yeah, she would. I mean, I, it was the happiest day of my life. I thought, man, I can't believe that this woman, this amazing woman, wants to live with me the rest of my life. So we got married. And things went real well for about four or five years. You know, a couple of kids came along in the middle of that. I had no idea there was a problem in our marriage at all. Until one day. Well, being a guy, I have no idea what that means. What does it mean to be, because you know, we don't even know what romantic means. Well, she says, you know, you used to be romantic when we were dating, why are you not romantic now? Well, I didn't even know I was romantic when we were dating. <laughs> I, didn't, I, could, I couldn't relate to that word. So she would say, well, I'd just like you to see if you could be more romantic. So I thought, well, 
Okay, so I tried bringing her home flowers to see if that would help. Well, a year or two go, it goes by, and, and, and she comes to me again. You know, I, I just wish you would be more romantic. And you know, and, I, and I'd seen some of the, the magazines she had been reading, you know, the girl magazines, the ones that say there's little articles in there that says put a little spark back in your life and your marriage, you know? And so I thought, well, see, here's the problem. Here, and I told her, I says, here's your problem. You have some false expectations about married life. You're, you're thinking, you're reading something that is really not reality. And I said, you know, you're just getting yourself all worked up on these things. You've got to just stop reading. In fact, I told her, stop reading these kind of articles because you're just messing with our happy little life we have going here. <laughs> well, it didn't change. You know, she still harped on me. And, and I got to the point where I, it started making me angry because I didn't know what I was doing that she wanted me to do. I mean, I was doing what I thought as a man I was doing to, to love her was to work hard, bring the money home, and, and provide the best life I could for her and the kids. And yet it, she still wasn't happy. And then she, you know, a few years later on, then she says, you know, I, I just don't feel loved by you. And, I, and I'm pulling my, I said, what are you talking about? I, I mean, I can't work any harder than I'm doing. I can't bring it, I, I'm making all the money I can make. What do you mean? She says, I don't care about all that stuff. I just want you to, I just want to feel like you love me. And I was, I had no idea what she was talking about. Clueless. And the more she harped on me, the more angry I became because, you know, I'm a fixer. Most men are fixers. We like to fix things. She was broken. <laughs> and I couldn't fix her. I didn't know how to fix her. I didn't know anything about it. You know, I could fix my car. I could fix the lawnmower. But I couldn't fix her because I was so ignorant and untrained and unknowledgeable about what I was supposed to be as a husband that I was neglecting her to the point where she was feeling absolutely miserable. Well, things didn't get any better. As the years rolled by, finally the kids left the house, and we were here alone, just the two of us. After 30 years, or actually 25 years of marriage or so, the kids left. And it's just her and I. You know, I used to depend a lot on the kids taking up all the air in the room, you know, talking, <laughs> laughing, carrying on conversation. I just, had, I just got to sit back and let it happen. I didn't have to get involved. But now that they're gone, it was just her and I. And we sat across the dinner table there one night, and she looked at me and she says, I don't think I'm ever gonna laugh again now that the kids are gone. And I thought, well, how am I gonna make her laugh? What do I gotta, gotta come home with jokes? What, you know, I, again, I wasn't getting what was going on. And then she asked me, well, is there anything you'd like to talk about tonight? <laughs> and I said, I got nothing, you know, <laughs> got nothing. I worked all day, I'm tired, I'm home, I just want to eat, watch a little TV and go to bed. I mean, there's nothing else for me to do. And she looked at me and she says, you know what? You're a boring person. You are really boring. And, I, and I, it was like a slap. I thought, holy cow, I mean, am I really a boring person? Well, yeah, to be truthful, I was. I was very lazy when it came to communicating and talking and trying to bring up a subject that we could talk about. I just, I didn't do it. And so, yeah, I was boring. So I, had, I told, told myself, well, okay, I gotta try to bring something home every night so we can have something to talk about. Well, things gradually lumped along here, still not very happy. And then she got to the point where she was so miserable that she, I couldn't hardly live with her anymore. She would complain and complain and complain about me. And I thought, you know, this is not the way to live. This is not the way to live. I can't live with her being so miserable. She's so miserable, she's making me miserable, and I didn't know how to fix her. So I got to the point one day when I told her, you know, I, 
if you don't change, if you don't start appreciating who I am as your husband and all the work I do around here and, and the providing so abundantly, if you don't change your attitude about me, and I think maybe we should separate, we need a divorce. And I actually fantasized about that, what it would be like not to live with a woman, a, bra a brawling woman, as the Bible says. <laughs> It's better to live in one corner of the hop, hop than with a, bra a brawling woman. <laughs> one here. <laughs> and I didn't understand why. I didn't understand why she got so miserable. And I had to come to the, I realized and understand the reason we were so miserable is because I was ignorant. I had no idea what was required of me as a husband. And I had to learn that. I had to, I had to actually go somewhere where I could learn how to be a Christ-like husband to my wife. Because I, I wasn't getting it where I was at. I had to go outside to get that information. So things have changed. And we're going to share those stories with you as time goes on, these, these tools that we learned that actually transformed our marriage and really made it what God really wants a marriage to be like. God says it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to find a wife. I thought, well, what is God thinking? This is not such a good thing here. God did not make marriage so we could be miserable. He wants us to be happy. He wants to have a fulfilled life where we can enjoy each other. But because of ignorance, my ignorance as a husband, I nearly destroyed our marriage. And thankfully, God plucked me out of there at the right time and gave me the instruction that I needed to be able to fix things. But it was nip and tuck. I'm telling you, we came that close to separating, divorcing because of that. Okay, I'm going to let Claudia tell her side. Let's see. Test? Hello? No? Hello? Yeah, yeah I just got to speak with a low voice. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to go over everything he just said. Um, I always find that when I do this part of the coaching that we do, I find it hard for me because I have to go back 20 or so years ago and find that girl that I was because I'm not her anymore. I, I've changed. God changed me. God changed our relationship. And so what he says is true. We're all the same. We're just in varying degrees of sameness here. And um, that girl uh, started out in a, a broken home. And that's one of the things I want to bring out is that when we come into relationship, whether we're in relationship in a marriage or we're in relationship with each other, and, and, and we need to see that these principles that we're going to be teaching and coaching you over the weeks up ahead are principles that be, can, can be used not just in this close relationship or with our children, but it also is applicable to each of us here in this room. It, it applies. My relationship, what I bring to the table, what you bring to the table, it applies here in this room. And that was one of the things that I learned over the last 20 years. Each of us carries a garbage bag. We, have, we are imprinted from the time we are born in our family of origin. People that are in our lives were imprinted and Satan knows how to imprint us with negative things. And we just stuff those things into garbage bags and we carry them along with us. And we don't give them any mind and we don't think that they matter, but they do matter because I'm bringing my garbage bag into this relationship and he's bringing his garbage bags into, his, into this relationship. And we don't think that they're applicable, but they seep out. That garbage seeps out of that plastic bag a little by little. He was Catholic, I was nothing. I wasn't raised with any kind of religion. He had brothers and sisters, I was an only child. Uh, I came from a broken home, he did not come from a broken home. Uh, my mother was divorced, we lived with my aunt, so I'm in a household of women, no men, none. Not, not any brothers, not any fathers, not any uncles, nothing. Just my aunt, my mother, my girl cousin, and myself, so this is a household of women with women's perspective. So he convinced me a lot of the times along the way that it was my fault because I didn't understand a male perspective. And it was true, I didn't. 
and so I had to I had to learn that over the years. But I've come to see over the over the 30 years that it was our past. It was um, all of the act all of the experiences, all of the perspectives that were given to me, I was living my life out of that lens. And I thought he understood my story. He understood my lens. He understood my perspective, but he didn't. And uh, I didn't understand his. And so when you get two people together with two different perspectives, two different temperaments, two different spiritual giftings, two different everything, that you have to make that mesh and you have to make it work, but you can't make it mesh and work if you don't understand. And so my part of the story was is everything that he said about the dating and the whatever, and it was all wonderful and all of that, but I came, I came to this marriage broken. I came to this marriage with holes and needs and emptiness because I didn't have a father. Now, my dad was an alcoholic and he was a musician and my mother uh, left him and I later learned many, many, many years later that there was abuse. So I always perceived, without even asking the question, that I had been abandoned instead of the perspective that my mother had rescued me from an abusive situation. And so I came to the marriage with the feeling that if I wasn't perfect enough, and good enough that I would be left, I would be abandoned, I would be discarded, and whatever. And that's, that's not a, a thing that I, I academically thought, but that was something that ran me emotionally. And um, so as we're going along in our marriage, and, and we're getting older, and we're growing older, and we're having kids, and we're in church, I was running myself ragged with perfectionism. I was a people pleaser. I was a perfectionist. I used to, I used to, I can't believe this anymore, but I used to wax the linoleum floor. Most of you wouldn't know what linoleum is, but I used to wax the linoleum kitchen floor every week. And then at the end of the month, it was so yellow from the wax that I'd have to now strip that whole floor. And I just thought, that in order to get love from him, in order to get value and acceptance and approval, if I could just be perfect enough and good enough and right enough. And he used to think that I always wanted to be right, like, well, I'm just right. And I couldn't ever explain to him that if you were wrong, bad things happened. So I strove for rightness. And, but all my rightness and all my perf perfectionism was not gaining me the things that I needed to, to heal my soul, to heal my heart, to fill up those, those empty spaces. And um, well, as an example of how things run you, I was just thinking about it today when we were singing, how, how Satan imprints us with negativity, and it starts when we're young. When I was in sixth grade, we were, in class, I don't know why we were all standing in rows like a choir, but the teacher had us singing, and, the, and I was singing, and I was enjoying myself, and I remember this boy leaned over, and he whispers in my ear, you sound terrible, you sing horrible. And from that day forward, I never wanted to sing in front of anybody, and to this day, I'm very aware that if I'm behind somebody, I hope they're not hearing me because that she kid... She has a nice voice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that kid made me believe I couldn't sing. And so that's the type of thing we carry. I mean, that's just one little physical minor thing. We carry lots of stuff in our life based on things that people have told us, whether you're uh, Wayne's father made him feel like a loser, and, and he went to Catholic school, so he had nuns, and you'll hear these stories along our journey, but he had nuns that would slam his head up against the blackboard, and I didn't realize that through our marriage, when I would say something, or, or what he perceived was complaining, and it wasn't, I wasn't complaining, I was seeking to be loved. I needed to be loved, I needed to be valued, and I knew that all the physical stuff I was doing wasn't getting me anywhere. And, but he would perceive me as, the, as his father, like I was his father, 
or I was, what is her name, Sister Mary Ellen Grace, or whatever <laughs> the lady was that was slamming his head up against the blackboard. Calling me stupid in front of the whole class, yeah. Right. And so he always <laughs> felt like he was stupid when I was doing the com complaining. So this is some of the things that we learned in our journey, but I thought, I said, well, what gives us the right to stand up here and talk about marriage? And then I said, well, we're old, for one. <laughs> And we've been married 52 years, and we've been in the, in the pits and the dump, and God rescued us and, and brought us out on a journey uh, over the last 20 years, and it restored our relationship, and uh, we want to be able to share that with you. But uh, everything that he said was true about how we started out, and then the mid, mid part of our relationship, I was getting sicker. I had... I literally starved myself to death. If I could just be thin enough, then I would be approved. And I had anorexia before they even put a label on anorexia. I almost died from the mumps when my daughter was two years old um, because of the anorexia. And uh, all these different uh, physical things that came out in my body, I had, um, they called it back then a nervous breakdown. Really, it was a, a massive adrenal burnout. And it was all from people pleasing and doing and running myself ragged. To, I was trying to please everybody in the church and please my husband and please my kids and driving kids to and from school and doing all these things just to feel that I was valuable and that I was important to him and that I was needed. But um, then God, through a lot of prayer, I had prayer, I prayed my way through this marriage. I was on my knees more than I was standing up. And... I he read, needed it. <laughs> and, he, and he was beating me up mentally in that there was something wrong with me. It's those books you read. Okay, so I don't read those books. It, it's uh, that person you're hanging out with or, or things like that. And so I was constantly I, evaluating. Been the Bible. And yes, that too. You know the two scriptures the ladies were talking about uh, that, oh, that uh, they love to beat women up with? You know, the one about spending your husband and making sure that, that uh, you respect your husband. I mean, every time I tried that on her, it was like throwing gasoline on a fire. It never worked because it was, and we'll explain to you why that doesn't work. The scriptures are there, and it says they're to do that, but there's a way it has to be done in order for it to work, and they never explain that to the men, what, what it is they need to do in order to have the wife be able to live out those scriptures that, are, that they're so beat up with. So I was getting sicker <laughs> through this marriage and uh, really suffering physical ailments. And I was reading every book that had been produced on marriage. I mean, if it said, wrap yourself up naked in saran wrap, meet him at the door, I would, tr would I like tried. that one. That was good. <laughs> I would have tried that and probably did. And but it was, it was satisfying for a while, and it got me what I needed for a while, but it wasn't real, and I knew it wasn't real. And it just, it morphed its way into, after like 30 whatever years of marriage, into I was beginning to resent him, and when he came home from work, I actually had gripping anxiety in my stomach because it was like, uh, like an abusive father coming home or something. And it's not that he abused me, it was just that I was being I, neglected. I was being neglected and I wasn't being cared for. My spirit wasn't being cared for. He didn't even know I had a spirit. And human spirit. A human spirit. And so, and I was being um, maligned on a spiritual level, like I wasn't converted. He, he oh. was, used to accuse me that I wasn't converted. And I, I was like, oh my gosh. I said it. How much plainer can it be? It's right there in black and white. If you just submit to me and respect me, you would be happy. It's in black and white. Why aren't you getting it? I, I actually did. I, I, I questioned her conversion at one point. I thought, she, she must not even be converted because it's so clear. Yes, this is all true. This is all true. And the worst part of it was, is we're going off to church. I'm well dressed. I have a hundred pairs of shoes. I have a boat. We go skiing. We take trips. We do all the stuff. I had a nice house. We had money. On the outside, we were looking good. And on the inside, it was rotten to the core. And God was about 
to change that almost at the moment when I said I'm done. When he said he was contemplating divorce, I never contemplated divorce because I'd come out of that and I had determined in my mind that would not happen. But I was emotionally separating from him. I was emotionally divorcing him and I didn't care anymore. But God, I don't know why he takes so long sometimes to answer a prayer, but he does. He always answers. It took 30 years. <laughs> 30 years. I, like I said, I'd read everything, and finally at the end of that I thought, I'm not doing this anymore. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I tried everything to be the perfect wife, to be, uh, to be whatever it was he wanted, that I would be able to receive that love from him. And I didn't feel loved. I didn't feel appreciated. Um, and like I said, it's hard for me to go back because I'm not her anymore. And I don't feel those things anymore. You don't feel the pain. I don't feel the, that pain anymore. And so what happened was when I finally said I was done, and I think God <laughs> knew I was done because I didn't feel anything anymore except utter and absolute bitterness and resentment. Um, a friend of mine called me up and said, I went to this seminar and there's, he, the man writes this book, Ken Nair writes this book, Understanding uh, the heart, heart of, a man. Uh, of a Man. And there was, must have been this last little spark left in me because I thought, well, I'll get that book because maybe the very fact that I didn't have brothers or a father, it must be my fault once again. I will get this book and I will learn what it means, what it, what it is all about men. So I go and I buy the book. I go to his office and I buy the book. I bring it home, I lay it on the counter, and he comes home from, Wayne comes home from work, and he picks it up on his way into the bathroom, and he comes out of the bathroom later, and he says, you're not reading this book. <laughs> so anyways, to... Uh, it was, uh, I didn't want her reading it because it was an indictment on me and my lack of uh, leadership in the, in the family, in the... <laughs> so anyways, uh, my friend had said they had gone to a seminar and, you know, we should go. And so I looked at the calendar, put it on the calendar, signed us up for the seminar, and I went. And I didn't have much hope because I had done all this stuff before, and I thought it was going to be all the same old, same old. Beat up the woman. Beat up the woman and, and whatever. So anyways, we went to the seminar, and that evening... Uh, started on a Friday night and that evening when he spoke I thought oh my gosh this man knows me it's like he's been in my house and he knows me personally this human being up there that I don't know and uh, we stayed at a hotel that night so we didn't have to come back and forth and I just let everything out I just ripped and roared about all the pain that I had been held inside of me and so that's what we want to share with you is our journey of 20 years of applying this, how, it was, how we had gone to the precipice of no return, and God rescued us, pulled us up out of there, and restored our relationship. And we added more to what we, God added more to what we had learned in that seminar. We went to classes uh, every year for four and a half years, for two hours every single week. We were not allowed to miss one, you had to make it up. Wayne spent the first year and a half trying to disprove everything that he had heard, and so we had to make up the first year and a half. I, I thought if I could discredit it somehow, then I'd be off the hook, but it didn't work. I had to go back and do it over. So we just want to share with you, this is a perspective. This is our life. We're sharing with you our life, our journey, and as we go along in the weeks ahead, you'll hear more about our story, about the past, and about the, you know, where, what brought us forward. But we, were, we wanted to be able to share what we've learned so that you can not just only apply it in your marriage, whether your marriage is good, you could improve it, or if it's not so good, you could improve it, or just the, the human interaction and relationships that we have with each other because the principles are applicable there. And even you can, like for men, if you're in an office environment and you need to you know, uh, care for a woman in your office, not like your wife, but you know, that you would, understand, un you would understand where that person is coming from. And uh, it, it restored our life. God answered my prayers just in the nick of time. I didn't think he had answered in the nick of time. I thought it was too late, but he wasn't. And um, 
I like my husband. I not <laughs> only, Again. <laughs> I, I, I not only love him, I always did, but I, there was a period of time where I, I just plain didn't like him. And I like him. I like him again, but it was how God, what God used to teach us to get to a better place, and so we would want to be able to help to share that with you. Oh, you can hold on to that. I've got one here. Yes, uh, so it's been quite a, quite a trip. The, uh, the marriage seminar that, we t that she talked about, it was, first of all, she had to threaten me to even get me there. You know, it's not a, marriage is not a subject men want to talk about. It, it's like, it's so uncomfortable that we don't even want to go there. And so uh, for 30 years, I refused to go to any seminars. Well, this particular one, she, she threatened me. She says, if you don't go to this seminar, I'm going to the ministry, and I'm going to tell them that we have marriage problems, and we need some help. And I thought, oh, my, you can't do that. You, you, de you destroy my whole image that I have with the, with the, with the ministry. And so because of, to protect my pride and not let that be exposed, I agreed to go to this seminar with her. Well, when I found out it was uh, like three days of seminar, it wasn't, you know, a, an hour deal. Like, what, what, what's there to learn about marriage that would take three days? And I couldn't imagine that it, it would be that long. But uh, I decided to go, and, and what, I have to say that when I heard it explained to me from the point of view of a Christ-like man and his responsibilities he has to God for the condition of his marriage, not the wife. God put the man as the head, so he's the responsible one. When that was explained to me, and he went, proceeded to go through what is necessary for a Christ-like man, a Christ-like husband, to care and love for his wife, and what that entails, I was totally blown away. I, I mean, I was, I was so embarrassed because of what I didn't know that I could hardly look my wife in the face after that. And so I decided to go to these classes because God had, had turned the light on me to show me that there, was, that there was requirements, there was necessities as a man. There was things that I had to know in order to love my wife in a way that she can feel loved and feel appreciated. I was absolutely clueless. I had no idea what I needed to do. And so we went through those classes, and then you not only had to learn it, but we had to apply it. And that was the hard part, applying. It's one thing to hear something, what you're supposed to do. It's another thing to apply it. And I'm telling you, guys, this was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, was to apply the things that I had learned, the things that were required of me by God. But the result was, is totally amazing. It so changed our life. And now we, you know, as we're getting kind of old here, we've taught this for a lot of years. We've been, we've been doing marriage coaching now for 15 years. And uh, we've, we've helped a lot of people. But we're getting old. You know, we're kind of long in the tooth here. So <laughs> what we're doing is we're looking for some guys and, and wives here who are willing to learn what we have learned and apply it in your own marriage. Not just learn it, but apply it and see the difference that it will make in your marriage. And then after a period of time, begin to teach others. Teach others, because this information that we're going to be sharing with you is incredible. The understanding that you will learn is so incredible that you'll, you'll wonder why it was never ever taught to you. And I believe that this information is even going to be taught in God's kingdom. I think it's that important. So we're in training right now. That's, that's what we're doing right here. We're in training for positions in God's kingdom when he sets up it on the earth here. And our job is they're going to be teaching other people how to live. And marriage being one of the most important things on God's agenda. Because family and marriage is so important that we're going to be teaching others how to live. So I want to encourage you guys to listen intently, apply what you learn, and you're going to see a difference. Now, you're not going to see it right away. 
<laughs> you're not going to see it right away. It's going to get worse before it gets better, I'll tell you that. <laughs> okay? It will get worse before it gets better. Because when you start, when your wife realizes she has now an opportunity for a husband to learn and to understand the things that she cares about, she's been holding on to a lot of stuff. Well, stuff you, you had no idea she's even holding on to. Well, I had locked my heart away, and when we were in classes and they began to stir what I call pond sludge, you know, when you see these movies where you're in the jungle and here's this green, crusty stuff over a, a lagoon or whatever, and somebody throws something in there and it like cracks. And I felt like that was my, my heart, that was my insides, and that when they started teaching things and they were starting to stir that pond sludge, uh, it wasn't a pretty thing at all and I and I had a cold heart and so they were God was beginning to warm my heart up because I thought well you know this is all sounds all good but is this going to be another two-year stint that it works for two years and then it doesn't you know so okay uh, yeah we're we're at 45 minutes and that's kind of our time limit for each session yeah, it's you know when we first gave this or several times we've had all, all day to present this five and six hours, so all at one time. So we have to break this up into segments, unfortunately. Uh, so next time we're gonna bring even more information or actually get into the actual tools that you can start applying that will help change your life. I just wanna send a, out a little uh, heads up to the men out there right now. And I, I really wanna thank you for being here. I mean, it, it takes, you had to be courageous to even show up today, I know that, because I went through it myself. But I just want to give you a heads up that we're, we're going to get into some things in our classes here that are going to stir some things in your wife that she's been holding on to for a long time. But it's an opportunity for you to heal the damage that's been done and to make her feel cared for and loved again. But in the meantime, she's going to want to share some things that she's been holding on to. And so what I want to encourage the men right now is that if you go home today and your wife unloads on you, <laughs> do not defend yourself. <laughs> Wrong thing to do. Don't defend yourself. You want to say to her, honey, I realize I, I probably don't know a lot about marriage, but I want to learn and I'm going to hear and I'm going to learn what Wayne and Claudia are teaching because I want to repair our marriage, I want to repair our relationship. That's all you need to say. Don't say anything more, okay? Because it'll just heap coals on your head. <laughs> so, a little heads up. Because I tried that with her, you know, tried to justify myself after the seminar, and it, it, would, it didn't go well, okay? <laughs> so just remember that. Just be patient with your wife. Say, you know what, I'm, I'm here to learn, and I wanna be a God, a Christ-like husband to you, and I, and, I'm, I'm, I, and I wanna apply what I'm learning so that our marriage, can be what God wants it to be, so our children can see a marriage that is, that is honorable in God's eyes and not shameful. So, kind of a heads up, guys, okay? But next time, we're gonna, we're gonna go into something that's so important, you're not gonna wanna miss it, because if you don't get the, the thing that we're bringing next time, you won't get anything else that we're gonna put on top of it. So be here if you can. Okay, now we've got the, we don't have time to go into that. We're going to have to wait because of the time. She's anxious to get into it, but we're going to have to wait. What's the reminder? This yeah. is just a reminder. Yeah. We're going to, okay, we're going to go into it. I just thought just occurred to me that I should tell you <laughs> that uh, we're going to go into Ephesians 5, verse 25 next time to see what it means when God says that a husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. We do not, as guys, really get the depth of what that statement is talking about, and we're going to go into that, okay?